When we hear people say America doesn't build big things quickly anymore, they're probably thinking in part of Cold War era aeronautical engineering. The B-52, threatening devastating counterattack to any aggressor, the mightiest bomber in history. This is the B-52. It was designed in 1948, operational in 1952, and delivered to the military in 1955, and is still in service some 60 years later. It is hard to imagine that an aircraft designed to meet the needs of the Cold War has maintained its longevity well into the 21st century. So how do we go from that to... A portion of the plane's fuselage blew off. Boeing's 737 MAX 9 planes are grounded right now, triggering cancellations nationwide. What happened to that first company, the one that built the B-52s, the one that's responsible today for moving two million civilians every single day and protecting American troops? Are these even the same company anymore? Boeing was founded in 1916 by William Boeing. They started off making smaller aircraft out of an old shipyard in Seattle. They're pivotal in pioneering aircraft into what we know today for military, mail, and civilian use. Boeing was something of a hydro in 1934. It was this huge conglomerate buying up and merging with anyone operating in the aviation space. The Air Mail Act broke up aeronautical corporations, namely Boeing, into three parts. One part would design and manufacture aircraft, another would operate the airlines, and a third would research and develop new aviation technology, Boeing, United Airlines, and United Technologies, respectively. So the company that we know as Boeing really started here. Post-1934, Boeing's first president was Claremont Egved, an aeronautical engineer and aircraft designer. This might just seem like a factoid, but this is really important. Boeing was known and had a culture for placing engineers at the top, and it showed. Their follow-ups to the B-52 program and entry into commercial aviation weren't too shabby either. The Jet Clipper, twice the length of a railroad car, with a wingspan big enough to line up a regiment. Cruising speed, 600 miles an hour. The 737 program has run for 60 years, raking in a whopping 17,000 orders, but was considered this massive risk, and Boeing executives were essentially betting the company on this program. And it's this calculated risk-taking and engineering culture that propels Boeing to a dominant position in the market. And critically, it validates the approach of putting the engineers in charge. The company went public in 1978 under the leadership of Thornton Wilson, an aircraft engineer. But it's not the 1930s anymore. And in DC, there's a different view of what the aviation space will look like at the close of the century. In 1978, Congress passed the Bipartisan Airline Deregulation Act, an act that prohibits states from regulating prices or service provided by airlines and disbanded the US Civil Aeronautics Board. Airlines adopt a hub and spoke model where a few hubs like New York, Chicago, or Atlanta act as hubs that connect smaller markets, the spokes. This maximizes load on any individual aircraft because you're carrying people going to the hub and people connecting from one spoke to another, but requires fewer aircraft for any individual carrier, which might sound bad at first for Boeing, but the act also opens the market for smaller, low fare and regional airlines to enter, increasing the aggregate demand for large aircraft but there's direct help from the government as well. I can't promise you, and no politician can, to repeal the laws of global competition. I can't promise you that you won't have to work not only harder, but smarter than ever before. Nobody can do that. But I think you know that your government has been inadequate to the task of preparing you to win if you play by the rules, if you do your part, if you're highly productive. That's my job. That's what this plan is designed to do. I hope you'll support it. I think it will secure the American dream for you and your children. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. In 1997, the Clinton administration blesses and protects a merger between Boeing's only other American competitor, McDonnell Douglas. This is almost exactly the opposite of the sentiment that was prevailing some 60 years prior. This leaves only the French Airbus as a competitor. Plus, the government only buys American, so there's really only one game in town. 
By 2022, 40% of Boeing's total revenue come directly via the Department of Defense and Department of Transportation. Boeing began heavy lobbying to remain the incumbent airline manufacturer and has spent over $288 million since 1998 on lobbying activity. It's the 10th biggest lobbyer in the U.S. And in 2009, the FAA allows Boeing to inspect its own planes to self-regulate its own safety. And because it's the only American game in town, the company has the best salesman in the world working for it. So there's a pretty clear degradation of market incentive here. There is no competition and revenue looks more or less guaranteed, but there's another problem too. And it has to do with the culture that we talked about. The executives are changing. We went through that stage in Apple where we went out and we thought, oh, we're gonna be a big company, let's hire professional management. We went out and hired a bunch of professional management. It didn't work at all. Most of them were bozos. The new guys have a bit of a different philosophy from the nerds who came before. Now, making well-engineered flying machines is important, sure. But you know what else is really important? Boeing's going higher. I think that this is their year. Last year, they had supply chain problems, had a couple of staff moves with some planes. Now it seems to be clear sailing. I even think there are going to be some Chinese orders. There's going to be back orders. They're going to make a lot of money for a plane. Buy the stock of Boeing. And when this is your top priority, you look to cut risk. You look to cut costs. And maybe most importantly, you look to increase shareholder value. Your thinking becomes fundamentally different. It's this double incentive problem where you're simultaneously lacking any domestic competition and you're thinking on a quarter by quarter, short term basis. See these dips in shares outstanding? These are stock buybacks. A simple way to think about this is the company buys back shares from the open market using cash, which reduces the number of shares in the market, reduces the cost of capital and increases the stock price. It's basically like giving a dividend to your shareholders. Boeing is one of the leaders in doing this and has spent over $60 billion in buybacks between 1998 and 2019. And for the record, they also used to give a dividend until the 2019 MAX incidents. And I can hear you typing, that's fine, they're a private company that they can do what they want. But really a lot of that money comes from you and me. It's kind of a de facto wealth transfer from taxpayers to Boeing shareholders. And this all comes while quality is degrading at the company. This message was circulated at Boeing internally and has made the rounds since the January 5th MAX incident. Because of Boeing's massive layoffs and strategy of offloading design work to foreign design centers, the company has lost control of its engineering processes. The recent actions of the Boeing company in its commercial airplane division are seriously jeopardizing the quality and safety of its airplanes. The former executives of McDonnell Douglas, which arguably as a company was in the end a complete failure in the design and manufacture of commercial aircraft, have taken control of Boeing and seem determined to gut the commercial airplane business all in the name of, quote, increasing shareholder value, end quote. So to answer our original question, are these even the same company anymore? No, this isn't the same company that built the B-52s. This is ostensibly an American engineering company that really deals in winning American contracts, subcontracting, and returning value to shareholders. And it's this pattern of complacency, profit-seeking, and greed that kick off the catastrophes, plural, for Boeing. The MAX is emblematic of these far deeper issues at the company and within the government, leaving programs exorbitantly over budget, behind schedule, and dangerous. So the Boeing story isn't about a loose bolt. It's not about one company's momentary mishap. It's a series of cautionary tales. A cautionary tale of how a once great American engineering firm can spiral in the face of greed. A cautionary tale of how governments can fly blind, perhaps willfully, for decades. A cautionary tale of what happens when a private entity is devoid of accountability. And a cautionary tale of how catastrophes are constructed, bolt by bolt. Hey 
your friends, I'm Armand. I wrote, edited, and produced the video you just watched. If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing to the channel. It's a free, easy way to support the content. I would really appreciate it. You can always change your mind later. A uh, special thanks to our patrons who helped make this video possible. And their names should be appearing on the screen now. And if you would like to be credited in future videos, see the link in the video description. And if you joined from the last video, I just wanted to say I really appreciate it. Um, you all are supporting me in doing the stuff that I love to do. Um, and I can't tell you how much that means to me. Thank you all, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace. Once upon a time. <laughs>